The Summer Olympic Games begin in 80 days, and the cloud of the pandemic is not clearing for the host city. Tokyo is in its third state of emergency, and the Olympics are now getting pushback from health care workers. Meanwhile, plans are moving forward to hold the games as organizers release another playbook meant to keep athletes and others safe from COVID-19. And the Olympic torch is still making its way across Japan, and a concern about that came true. Someone connected to the relay tested positive for COVID-19. Good morning, and thanks for joining us here for this month's edition of the Japan 2020 Digital Show. We'll cover those stories in just a moment and catch you up on the latest headlines and developments before our company's team heads to Tokyo to cover the Olympic Games here very soon. I'm Will Dupree at KXAN in Austin, Texas. And I'm Andrew Martin, based at KSEE-TV in Fresno, California. We're going to begin our show today by talking about taking a stand on the stand. Now, we're talking metaphorically, of course, here, Will, because the IOC has surveyed more than 3,500 competitors, 70% of whom support keeping the ban in place. And the ban we're talking about is the latest directive from the International Olympic Committee that political protests and messages will remain banned at the Olympics. So that means if athletes raise a fist or take a knee, they could still face punishment at the Tokyo Games. And the IOC also said that athletes cannot wear anything with a slogan like Black Lives Matter on it when they're at an Olympic venue. However, it can wear items like this. T-shirts with the words peace, respect, solidarity, inclusion and equality can be worn at Olympic venues. And while the IOC said each case would be judged individually, this photo right here, athletes who follow that example from American sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the 1968 Olympics could still be sent home. And Andrew, today we do have a guest here at our uh, joining us for this particular interview. So let's bring him in now and introduce him as he's been waiting so patiently for us here. Yes, this is uh, Jack Doles, a familiar face, a familiar voice. Jack is our sports director at uh, Wood TV in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He'll be going to Tokyo along with myself, part of our Next Star Olympics team. And Jack had the privilege last year to interview Tommy Smith. So we want to get some of his insight, a little bit of, uh, you know, of clarity on uh, everything that's going on in the world right now with this situation. Jack, 1968 was obviously 53 years ago. I think it was years later when, when Tommy Smith said that when he raised his fist, it was not a black power salute, it was a human rights salute. Did you guys talk specifically about what he meant by that? Yeah, Andrew, uh, you know, one of my favorite conversations I've had uh, during the course of my career was last June when I had the chance to sit and talk to uh, Dr. Tommy Smith. And, you know, we started it out, it was Dr. Martin Luther King who said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. And that was when we saw um, this interview happen, right when there were protests all across the country, some, some of them violent, some of them not so, uh, you know, some peaceful. But uh, he was very proud uh, of what people were doing across the country. Uh, and he said, you know, I asked him, knowing now what you know, um, if you'd have known that then, would you have done this protest? You know, he he was homeless for a while. He was publicly scorned and he became a villain at a time where he should have been a hero, you know, an Olympic gold medalist for the United States, but he chose to raise his fist uh, above his head in protest. And he said he stood on that victory stand to alleviate uh, pressures that he had from a childhood, especially those he did it for those who didn't have a voice. He stood not on the platform to show what he had done, but he was there uh, to give somebody else the, voice. Uh, and he was put there, he thought, on that platform by a higher power and a higher force. Uh, and um, he did that for others. Uh, because as we've seen, uh, this movement, there's still voices to be heard. Uh, Andrew, uh, uh, America is not happy. Um, and he stood up at a time where others wouldn't, he and uh, uh, John Carlos. And that took a lot of courage. Uh, and it, you know, it cost him a marriage, cost him his family, cost him a home for a while. Uh, but now he's, he's a great voice in this conversation. 
Yeah, both he and John Carlos. He won gold. John Carlos won bronze. They were sent home from the games for what they did. You know, Jack, in 2019, they were both part of the USOPC's Hall of Fame class, so they were welcomed into the fold, but it took a really long time. What did he think about being a Hall of Famer? And and the fact that uh, I, I don't think everything is smoothed over, but the fact that I guess everything did come full circle in a way. Yeah, I, and he was honored, but uh, Andrew, it, it, it took way too long um, for that to happen, but it did now. And, you know, he's honored by those statues that you see in other parts of the country. Um, and that's just an iconic gesture that he made there. You see that picture again, and it's just an iconic gesture. And one of those, he'll live in infamy, uh, and, and we'll know the name Tommy Smith, uh, in the Olympic history books because of what he did, uh, and the courage that it took. Yeah, it, it took way too long, Andrew, for that to happen because he's one of the great sprinters in American history. Yeah, and uh, I should point out that I'm based in Fresno, California. Tommy Smith was born in Texas, but he grew up in Lemoore, California. It's about 40 minutes from where I am. Lemoore High School is a school that, that we cover regularly, and Tommy Smith is a legend there. He was an amazing you know, athlete when he was in high school long before he got to the Olympic Games. You know, Jack, I want to ask you, you kind of touched upon the fact of in today's world, would he do it again? Does he support the USOPC's support of athletes when the IOC kind of said that they won't stand by athletes if they protest? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. He, he believes um, when you're on that stand, you should have that right uh, to voice your opinion. Um, you do it in a classy way, but, you know, what he did there was a silent gesture, raising that fist, and it meant, it, it didn't mean black power. Um, it meant human rights. You know, everybody should, you know, we're all created equal. And um, that's the way it should be. And uh, if it takes somebody to do something like that, uh, to get the conversation going, that he's proud to have made. He says, it, it, his quote was, no regrets, no seizures of thought, only that moment forward uh, that would take sacrifice. And he said he was very proud of the young people across this country that were doing the same thing now with all of the protests, because, you know, we aren't where we should be at this point as far as human rights and everybody being equal. Uh, we're just not there. We should point out too, Will, that we have an interview coming up later in this uh, later in this live stream with Noah Hoffman, a two-time Olympian, cross-country skier. He's part of an initiative called Global Athlete. Um, there are some worldwide unions out there, Global Athlete being one of them. There's another one in Germany, I believe, that have promised legal assistance to athletes who make political or social justice protests at the Olympics. So this is an ongoing conversation and something that uh, it, it's not going away uh, after, after the Olympics this summer. We're probably going to see something. There's, there's a lot going on with Beijing, you know, and, and China. And I, uh, yeah, I know that we all are familiar with the fact that there is a uh, – there's a chance, all chance, uh, of a boycott. You know, President Biden, I know, was looking into that. I don't think it's going to happen, but you never, you never truly do know. So, um, Jack, last question for you on this one. I know you also kind of touched upon it earlier, but when it comes to where the world is right now, social injustice, racial inequality, did, uh, did Tommy Smith say anything about his particular views on where we are as a world right now with everything that's going on? Yeah, I know. The biggest thing he said, Andrew, was how proud he was of the youth. Um, and he, here was a quote that I want to give you that was really interesting. He said, you can't go and throw a rock and expect to hit exactly what you want, you're, you're aiming for, but at least you're doing something to make things happen. We, do not throw, we did not throw a rock and hide our hand. We stood with a firm affirmation of what we believed in, and that is freedom. That is a cry for freedom. Um, and that's what he believes uh, is going on across the country. Some of these cries are louder than others, but um, <clears throat> since we're not where we should be yet, uh, this movement that started with Dr. King, you know, it may have started before that, but it really picked up with Dr. King. I think at that point, he thought we'd be at a different place by now, and we're having a lot of these same conversations. So, I thought that was just interesting the way he phrased that, uh, you know, not necessarily be throwing rocks, but having a voice, expressing it and, you know, igniting the conversation, igniting the spark that gets it going. And 
you know, puts things in a, in a direction that maybe we should be. Jack Doles, Wood TV in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Thanks so much for some insight there, Jack. We appreciate it. Great to be with you, Andrew. Well, very nice to see you, Jack. Thank you again for being here. In other news we want to touch on right now, organizers put out new rule books explaining how the Olympics will happen in the middle of a surging pandemic in Japan. The major highlights is that COVID-19 testing requirements is going to be for everyone involved in the games. Every participant must pass two tests before leaving their home country and will be tested again when they get to Japan. Athletes and those who work closely with them will be tested daily too. Everyone who participates in the games must avoid public transportation for the first 14 days. Olympics participants will only be allowed to eat at specified locations and for athletes that means only at the athletes village. Yeah, well, those participating in the Olympics can avoid a two-week quarantine when they get to Japan if they agree to fill out a detailed schedule listing their plans and download a tracking app. Organizers plan to announce next month what the capacity will be at the different venues. And you'll remember that fans from other countries not allowed to attend. Organizers plan to release additional guidelines soon in the coming well, hopefully days, but coming weeks at the very least. But this is all coming when Japan is seeing some very worrisome trends. We've got some numbers that we want to share with you, Will, especially related to the latest, you know, COVID-19 cases. Check this out. 602,000, actually almost 603,000 cases. There was a record 1,050 hospitalizations reported the other day and more than 10,000 deaths total due to the coronavirus. Tokyo is again, one of several new areas, or excuse me, one of several areas, once again placed under a state of emergency, which is set to expire May 11th, that's next Tuesday. The case count since April 25th, which is a little more than a week ago. Saturday saw the highest case count since January when Tokyo reported more than a thousand new cases of COVID-19. Experts say that that's from the new variants spreading in the country less than three months before the Olympics start. Officials are now requesting 10,000 medical workers, including 500 nurses, to work the event. Now, those nurses are not happy because, as the Associated Press is reporting, they are near their breaking point dealing with the pandemic, treating COVID patients in hospitals, and assisting with the vaccine rollout. Yeah, Andrew, we also had talked about the concerns about the ongoing Olympic torch relay and what risk that would spread COVID-19 and those uh, kind of worst fears were realized this past uh, month really in uh, one of the legs of the relay we found out that someone connected to the relay tested positive for COVID-19 and we mentioned that again at the beginning of the show but it turns out in this particular case a police officer developed symptoms and tested positive a day after he helped control traffic during a leg on April 17th. Local health authorities they are investigating but they said the policeman had on a mask and followed distancing measures. I know that will not allay some people's fears and concerns about this ongoing torch relay, which is still not over yet. It has a long way to go to get all the way across the country to reach Tokyo for the opening ceremonies, which you will be there for that, Andrew. And we mentioned last month that the leg uh, going through Osaka had to be completely taken off the torch relay just right. because of COVID-19 cases there as well. So this is a situation that is uh, definitely constantly being monitored as well as the vaccine rollout in Japan. And, you know, I, I the latest numbers from the World Health Organization will, Japan has administered two and a half million vaccine doses so far. And two and a half million seems like a big number, but when you compare it to the United States, 247 million people have been inoculated in our country. In Japan, it's about 1% of the population, so not very many. We asked our infectious diseases expert, Dr. Stephen Thomas, how he thinks that's gonna affect Japan's ability to safely hold the Olympics. Obviously, you know, the more people that are inoculated, the better it is for everyone, right? Because va vaccination doesn't just protect you from getting infected or getting sick. Uh, it can also uh, reduce your likelihood that you're going to pass it on uh, to somebody else. So, you know, is it a problem that the host nation only has about a 1% uh, vaccination rate? Um, you know, that's not where you would like to be 100 days out. But 
you know, again, depending upon what vaccine you're using, you can have someone fully vaccinated in four to five weeks. So, you know, there, there is time to kind of course correct. You know, Will, part of my conversation with Dr. Thomas, and I know that you've spoken with him a lot too, he told me that he actually does not think that we will ever truly live without COVID-19, that it's going to be part of the fabric of our society. Now, hopefully we don't have to wear face shields or masks for too, too much longer, but I think we do have to assume that it's going to be part of the fabric of our lives. And, you know, people are going to have to learn to live with what we've been going through for the last year. Again, hopefully not on the scale that we've been dealing with it, but it could be there forever. It could. Yeah, and he had mentioned that some of these, uh, the makers who have, of these vaccines that we have, so uh, Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, they are considering adding booster shots so that we can get them similar to flu shots and protect us not only from the flu, but from COVID-19 going forward. So this is definitely our new normal. Uh, I don't even know if it should be considered new anymore because of this is just the existing uh, circumstances that we have to live in going forward. And we are dealing with it, including the Olympics. They're going forward with everything. Well, um, Andrew, we did mention earlier uh, in your interview with Jack Dulles, which was so nice, uh, this group called Glo uh, Global Athlete. And uh, you actually spoke to a former Olympian uh, here in the U.S. who is a part of this effort. And you mentioned that Global Athlete is offering legal support services to any athlete that faces repercussions for potentially protesting at the Olympics this year. Yeah, we had a really good conversation. Uh, myself and Noah Hoffman, who is a two-time Olympian, he competed in Sochi, he competed in Pyeongchang. He's somebody who had a great experience at both of those games, and he wants others to have great experiences at the Olympics. But now he's got a new goal, which is to help really, you know, elevate the voice of the athlete. Well, let's listen to that conversation. It's our pleasure right now to be joined by Noah Hoffman, a two-time Olympian, cross-country skier who competed in both Sochi in 2014 and Pyeongchang in 2018. He's now part of an initiative called Global Athlete. Noah, you're on the board of directors here, and just let's let everybody know, what is Global Athlete? Yeah, Global Athlete is uh, an organization uh, that is trying to change the power dynamics in global sport. Uh, we believe that the International Olympic Committee and kind of the subsidiary, subsidiary organizations that they fund uh, have kind of unfettered power in, in international sport and that that has hurt not only uh, the athletes and the fans, but it has also hurt uh, the Olympics and the IOC's mission as well and that uh, a balanced power dynamic where athletes have equal power to administrators would be better for all Olympic sport and certainly for athletes. You guys really want to rethink the Olympic model and you were quoted recently in the New York Times. Can you tell us what your vision of the Olympics would look like? Yeah, we envision an Olympics where the athletes are the center of the show uh, more than the, the host country, more than the politics around it, more than the, the sponsors and where the athletes are what is, are, are driving the value of the games. Athletes like LeBron James, um, they're driving ratings. They're the ones that people are showing up to see. And at the Olympics, because the athlete voice is stifled, it is, it, it is just this huge spectacle where the athletes are an afterthought. And we believe that the Olympics will be better off if the athletes are at the center of it and have equal power to administrators. Can you tell us how you first got involved with Global Athlete? How did you find out about it? Yeah, so Global Athlete was founded by the former Secretary General of the World Anti-Doping Agency, who saw the way that the World Anti-Doping Agency, which is heavily influenced by the IOC, how they handled the systematic state-sponsored doping at the Olympics in Russia. And I felt that systematic doping firsthand, because I was in the race at the 50K, um, the closing the last race of the, of the Sochi Olympics. It's the marquee event, like the marathon of the Summer Olympics. The 50K closes out the games in the Winter Olympics. And it happened on the day of closing ceremonies. And I was in the lead pack for 48 kilometers. And I watched the three Russians ski away from the field up the final hill and, to, and sweep the podium. And then I watched their victory get celebrated. This victory that came from this state-sponsored doping get celebrated at the closing ceremonies. Additionally, I had, you know, cross-country skiing is a sport where there are huge advantages to doping. And I had friends who, were, who, who chose to, to dope to, to get a personal advantage. I lost out on qualifying for the U.S. ski team's A team one year, which was an additional $20,000 in funding. It would have made a huge difference to me. 
big by one spot and there were multiple dopers in front of me and they got caught later but it was too late for me to make the a team and the usk team so this was a really personal issue for me how many athletes do you have on board right now and what is the goal what is the ultimate goal here yeah so we we have uh in the neighborhood of 500 individual athletes who are signed up to support us but that's actually not our focus right now our focus is on actually bringing together individual athlete groups who represent either individual sports or individual countries um, and we have a group of really strong independent athlete groups representing more than 20 nations and 20 and, and different sports. So we're trying to, to solidify the athlete voice into one microphone, essentially. Will, some really good stuff there with Noah Hoffman. And again, I'll just summarize the last few points. He's got about 500 athletes, well, not just he, but the entire Global Athlete Initiative there are about 500 athletes uh, who are on board with what they're doing right now. Mm. He mentioned to me a couple of names, Keegan Randall and Jesse Diggins, who won gold in cross-country skiing in Pyeongchang. I actually interviewed Keegan Randall uh, after she won a gold medal, and she was just so appreciative of the adulation that everyone was kind of thrusting upon her because she had her, you know, her 15 minutes of fame there. Yeah. Basically, what Noah Hoffman says they want is to hold the IOC accountable. So really eye-opening conversation. Yeah, and I know that they had really been vocal about this rule that uh, about, about protesting in particular, and we also mentioned that they are going to offer legal support to any athlete that might face a consequence for, you know, raising a fist or taking a knee on the medal stand. Yeah, absolutely. Again, the goal is to bring athlete groups together, and they want to make sure that the athlete voice is heard. And you heard him mention LeBron James. Hmm. I don't know out there for everyone who's who's watching this how closely you follow the NBA, but LeBron has been very vocal, especially on social media as of late. And for a long time, athletes, they tried to kind of, you know, stay out of the political realm. But LeBron also, you know, publicly was supporting, excuse me, he was um, publicly supporting, you know, President Biden when he was running for president uh, and he was not a fan of Donald Trump. Yeah. Athletes are definitely using their voice in a lot of areas right now. And we are, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing that this particular, um, this particular initiative, Global Athlete, is trying to enact change on a worldwide scale for international sports. So it's more than just in one country or another. This is across the board. And he talked about having athletes from, from 20 different countries. So it's a powerful voice and a powerful message. That is for sure. Well, before we go, we kind of have a fun story to end with everything. It, a lot of eyes are obviously on the opening and closing ceremonies and what the athletes wear, Andrew. <laughs> That's right. What are you wearing today, Will? <laughs> Just a tie, a shirt, you know, my normal uniform. So it has not been outfitted by Ralph Lauren? It has not been. <laughs> okay, yeah, we want to show you guys this. The opening and closing ceremony uniforms. Team USA, once again, wearing clothing designed by Ralph Lauren, who has dressed the Americans since 2008. The closing ceremony outfits will include a traditional jacket, polo, and pants made with fabrics that are environmentally friendly. As for Team Canada, <laughs> Will, I know you're excited about this. Yes. Team Canada's uniforms. When these designs were released, people on social media pointed out what the Canadians would be wearing. It's a denim jacket, and that really caught people's attention. So much so that Team Canada jokingly tweeted, we hear people have been curious about our Canadian tuxedos. <laughs> it's got that graffiti look to it. Will, I, I like this. I know you do, too. Yeah, I do, too. Um, it is more modern. I mean, we are used to that kind of, like, standard set with the polo and the pants and the jacket and the matching outfits, and the mask is a new addition, at least for the Team USA. But this is kind of like a modern approach to it. It looks like it comes right out of a 90s rap video. You know, you have to have that baseball <laughs> cap just tilted to the side just a touch, right. right, in order to make it stylish. Right, and apparently the graffiti on it is because of the street art that happens in Tokyo. They wanted to borrow from that and put it on the clothing. So I think that's kind of a fun nod honoring the t Canadian tuxedo, but also the host city. I'm good with it. You know, any time that you can express yourself and do so again, even with all these you know, political protests, yeah. people want to make sure that everything is done peacefully. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it's okay to say what you want, but you never want to infringe on somebody else's rights. And I think that is the over, you know, the, the overlying theme, the, the message that, uh, you know, that has been shared here today. And, you know, for the last several months, it's an ongoing conversation. That's probably the best way to describe everything. That is for sure. Well, Andrew Martin, thank you for being here. And for everybody out there, we are still tracking these playbooks that are being released by the International Olympic Committee. More rules will be laid out, guidelines for not only athletes and participants in the Games, but also for the media, Andrew. 
That's true. Yeah, we're supposed to get some guidance, uh, I believe, in a couple of days on what the media is, is going to be allowed to do when we get to Tokyo. We've heard about daily saliva testing for athletes. We've got Olympic trials, uh, you know, coming up. Uh, I know they're, they're really exciting ones, right? I shouldn't say re- they're, they're all exciting ones, but the yeah. ones that a lot of people are paying attention to are swimming, track and field. Those are coming up soon. And yeah, we'll be back with you uh, Tuesday, July, uh, June 1st. And then the next month is July, which is when the Olympics are. So, well, we're getting closer. And I know this, uh, this stream is still says, you know, Japan 2020. It was supposed to be Tokyo 2020. It's going to be Tokyo 2020. One with it being, you know, they're, they're getting creative with the zero and e on right, there, but yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're getting close. Like you said, we are not only less than 100 days out, we're less than 80 days out at this point. That is so true. Well, they're moving forward. So are we. Andrew Martin, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. You bet. We'll see you guys next month, Tuesday, right, June 1st. Everybody. See you later, everybody.